Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Plodcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. One book off of the Canon shelf that I wanted to recommend to you guys was called Angels in the Architecture, A Protestant Vision for Middle Earth. This book came to mind as a very practical outworking of what Christians view as beauty and beauty in the everyday. The Middle Ages and Reformation began a conversation about truth, beauty, and goodness. Modernity and postmodernism tragically interrupted that conversation, and modern evangelicalism has often simply echoed the hollowness of our modern culture. But we can do better. Sadly, many Christians, while continuing to believe in the gospel, have become just as blind to the beauty of the universe and the need for a culture in which that beauty is recognized and cultivated. This book sketches a vision of the medieval Protestantism, covering such topics as creeds, poetry, history, the church, feasting, and storytelling, and they are to be found in the Christian faith alone. You can get Angels in the Architecture at canonpress.com. I really can't recommend this book enough. Welcome to the podcast. This is episode 152. 152. I want to talk about, uh, there's an odd title, Invisible Civilization and the Possible Boogaloo. Invisible Civilization and the Possible Boogaloo. First, let's define the, <laughs> let's define the Boogaloo, right? Well, uh, the Boogaloo or the Boogaloo Boys are, are basically, uh, I won't, I'm not going to try to categorize them, but they're, alt-right types who are basically anticipating a, uh, a major crack-up of the United States and a descent into anarchy. And when things descend into anarchy, the Antifa boys, the socialist boys, are going to discover how well-armed America really is. All right, so that's the boogaloo. Things, things descend into chaos. Uh, the the established authorities aren't functional anymore. Things descend to a shooting war, and when they descend to a shooting war, it's going to get ugly. And there you are. Uh, so that's that's the boogaloo, and I'm not speaking as an advocate uh, of it. May God spare us from that. If that happens, it's going to be really really ugly. So what do I mean by invisible civilization? Well, our civilization is a, an impressive cathedral, a uh, lofty Gothic cathedral. Uh, and it's the many striking, impressive, majestic features. And one of the most impressive things about this cathedral is that the flying buttresses that hold the whole thing up are invisible. The flying buttresses that, that hold the whole thing up are not visible to anybody looking at it. Now. What do I mean by that? Well, there are many things, many aspects to our society, um, which is a society that is governed by law, custom, and certain expectations of morality that keep it from descending into anarchy. To take a, mic a microcosmic example, suppose there's a power outage in your city. Let's say there's an electrical storm and there's a power outage, you've probably seen this before, and a busy intersection has the, the traffic lights go out. So all of a sudden, you've got all kinds of cars coming up to this busy intersection, and the traffic lights don't work. Well, I've seen that sort of thing turn instantly into a volunteer four-way stop, where everybody comes up to the intersection, they stop, and they wait for the other guy to go, and then they go. And it's, a, it's like there's stop signs posted, but there aren't stop signs posted. Everything, but it gets sorted out all by itself. Basically, the traffic lights are in everybody's hearts. Or the, stop, the stop signs are in everybody's hearts. So a, a person who doesn't see the flying buttress looks at something like that and says, oh, that's just the way people are. That's just, that's just human nature. 
Well, no, there are places that you could um, be pointed to certain traffic procedures, traffic patterns, and um, and traffic commotions at various places in the world with people driving on the sidewalk and and not paying any attention to any regulation, whatever. Uh, you could easily show that people are not inherently uh, that way. The fact that everybody turns it into a four-way stop is the result of all of them having been trained to stand in line for the drinking fountain in kindergarten. Uh, this is a consequence of civilization. It is not a feature of human nature. It is a feature of civilized, tamed human nature. So here's the problem. Once tamed, it, basically how far do you have to scratch uh, before the veneer of that civilization starts to wear off? How much does it have to degrade before you're back to a state of nature? All right. Now you could have, you could throw, you could take um, 20 people and throw them onto a desert island and have it all descend into a state of nature pretty quickly. It could descend into a state of nature within a week, depending on how much food there was, depending on, you know, depending on any number of things. You could have a Lord of the Flies. Um, situation develop, okay? Um, or if you have a continent with 300, uh, 330 million people on it, it might take a little longer to descend to a state of nature. But when you get down to that state of nature, nature red in tooth and claw, that's what the Boogaloo boys are talking about. That's that, Okay, it's getting to the point where it turned into a shooting war, we know who the bad guys are, and there is no Geneva Convention. There, are, there is no established authority. There is nothing to prevent lynch law. There's nothing to prevent massacres. There's nothing to prevent any, you know, uh, the desperate evil that's in the heart of man. That sort of thing uh, is a possibility. And if, if you are the kind of person who believes that, that the people line up at the bank and they line up naturally at the post office because that's human nature. If you believe that, then you, you have been fooled by what I'm calling invisible civilization. You think that that's a people feature, and it's actually a Christian civilization feature. And if you keep going the way you're going, you're going to cause all of that civilizational residue to be scraped away, and then when that happens, it gets ugly fast. So, what should Christians do? Well, we Christians need to be praying that God would spare us from that state of nature, that God would spare us from any kind of descent into a state of nature, into a state of anarchy, that God would enable certain governors and mayors and sheriffs and police chiefs, police chiefs to recover, to find their backbones somewhere and to start standing up to rioters, start standing up to disruptors, because where justice is not speedily executed upon the criminal, as it says in Ecclesiastes 8.11, I think it is, there the heart of man is filled to do evil. Continuing on with Podcast 152. This is our Hamartiology section. Our word this time is Afron. And it is the word for a fool, Aphron, A-P-H-R-O-N, Aphron. Our first use is the Lord's rebuke of those who do not see that external religion alone is worthless. There's a certain kind of person who thinks that God can be bought off with uh, an external parade or an external show. Luke 11:40. Ye fools, Jesus said, did not he that made that which is without make that which is within also? In other words, did, did not the God who made the outside of the cup also make the inside of the cup? Didn't the God who made the outside of a man and the, the, the part of a man, the body of a man that can conduct liturgical observances, didn't that God also make his heart and mind and conscience? You fool, And notice that Jesus says, neglect of this, m missing that point, is folly. He calls them ye fools. The Lord also applies it to the man in the parable who did not understand the relative value of monetary wealth and spiritual wealth. This is the guy who was, not, who was 
rich in material goods, but he was not rich toward God. But God said to him, this is Luke 12, 20, God said unto him, Thou fool, th- there's, there it is, Aphron, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So who's going to own your stuff when you die tonight? Who's going to own your stuff when you die tonight? Or put another way, who's going to own your stuff when you die tonight, you fool? All right? So that's folly. Being rich in material goods uh, and not being rich spiritually toward God. That's folly. And being the kind of person who believes that God can uh, be fooled or put off or bought off with an external show. And then the Apostle Paul rebukes the argumentative fool who doesn't understand the connection between death and resurrection. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 15, 36, Thou fool, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. So Paul is saying that um, people who don't understand the necessity of death to a subsequent resurrection are foolish. You fool, that which, is, that which thou sowest is not quickened, except it die. So it has to die in order to be raised. On another occasion, he rebuked the Corinthians for putting up with folly, suffering fools gladly. For ye suffer fools gladly, he says, seeing you yourselves are wise, 2 Corinthians 11, 19. So it's apparently a problem. It's apparently foolishness of some sort to put up with foolishness. On a few other occasions, Paul assumes the posture of a fool again in an as-it-were stance. We talked about this uh, last, uh, last week in our podcast with a different word, uh, but again, this is an as-it-were folly, uh, an, an as-it-were stance. 2 Corinthians eleven sixteen. I say again, let no man think me a fool, if otherwise yet as a fool receive me, that I may boast myself a little. So don't think me a fool, but go ahead and treat me as a fool if that will enable me to get this thing out that I want to, that I want to tell you. But it's a, Paul's adopting the posture of a fool. He's not becoming a fool. Then in 2 Corinthians 12, 6, a little bit later, For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool, he says. I shall not be an Aphron. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. So Paul's going to carry on a little bit. Uh, and then he, he, earlier on, he says, yet as a fool received me. And then here he says, but I'm not a fool. I, I don't want to be a fool because I want you to understand what's going on here. Uh, uh, then a few verses later, I am become a fool in glorying. Ye have compelled me, for I ought to have been commended of you. For in nothing am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. So, Paul says, uh, look, you pushed me into, you goaded me into um, acting like a fool. I became a fool in glorying. In the boasting that I did, that was foolish, but, but notice the implication. It was foolish, but it wasn't really foolish. In another place in Scripture, the same word is rendered as foolish. He's talking about instructors of the foolish who are not qualified for that task. That's in Romans 2.20. As instructor of the foolish, he's rebuking the Jews. As instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has the form of knowledge and of the truth in the law. So you Jews are setting yourselves up to be teachers and instructors, and you think you're qualified to instruct fools, but you're, you're not really. And the Apostle Peter tells us that our good works silence the ignorance of foolish men. 1 Peter 2.15 and so is the will of God, that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. There it is, a foolish men. And then last, the word is rendered as unwise. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, there it is, be ye not Aphron, okay? but understanding what the will of the Lord is. That's Ephesians 5.17. And then it goes on in the next verse to say, to describe what that folly would be, what that unwisdom would be, and what it would be is being drunk with wine, wherein is excess, and instead of that, they should be filled with the Holy Spirit, and so on. So my book review uh, this time is a a book by J. Gresham Machen. It's not really a book. It's a, um, 
Uh, it's called The Person of Jesus, and it's a collection of radio addresses that J. J. Gresham um, Machen made. The uh, lectures or the talks on the radio retain very much the colloquial feel, the co- colloquial flavor that these radio address, uh, radio address would have. And what Machen does is he walks through who Jesus is and the gospel of Jesus Christ in a really potent, powerful way. The reader, I, I listened to it on Audible. I got this on Audible. Uh, the reader is very good. And combined with the fact that he was reading the transcript of uh, a radio talk, and the reader was um, an effective preacher, shall we say? It it was very um, it was very powerful. So the person of Jesus by J. Gresham Machen. He he walks through um, the the doctrine of God, the person of Jesus, who Jesus is, the person and work of Jesus Christ, what Jesus Christ did. Now one of the things that uh, Machen is doing is he's interacting of course, with the liberalism of his day. But we have to keep in mind that nothing ever really changes. Liberalism is simply um, unbelief. Uh, There have always been people who have not believed the gospel, and liberals were simply those who did not believe the gospel while receiving a paycheck from denominations that professed to believe the gospel. There was an, an additional layer of hypocrisy involved with the liberals, which was ironic because the liberals like to like to uh, preen themselves on their honesty, follow, following, I follow the argument wherever it leads. Well, certainly, no one can object in principle to someone who follows uh, a minister who loses his faith and becomes an unbeliever. Um, the problem that many people had was these people who lost their faith and who continued to draw the paycheck. So, Machen is interacting with uh, the unbelief of his day when he is um, uh, laying the gospel out, but that's not, it's not irrelevant. It's, uh, it's again, uh, C.S. Lewis once said that whatever's, whatever's not eternal is eternally out of date, and uh, I could, you could flip that around and say whatever is eternal is eternally fresh. Whatever is eternal is constantly new. It's the good news. It's, um, it's the new commandment that uh, John left for us. And so, um, this book, The Person of Jesus by J. Gresham Machen, is really powerful. It's really good. It's good, succinct, straightforward. It's just good stuff.